We are Life Church Livonia. All right, what's up, Life Church Livonia? How are we doing? Woo! That's right. Way to be first service. Mild energy, semi minimal. Don't, wouldn't expect anything less. <laughs> Well, my name is Alex. I'm on staff here at Life Church Livonia, and I just want to say if this is your first time, welcome. Really glad you're here. I'm really pumped to be here with you. If we have not had the pleasure of meeting, I'd love to meet you in the lobby after service today. Um, we are in the second week of a series we're calling How to Walk on Water. This is a series on faith, about what faith is, what faith isn't. It's a series where uh, we're going to be looking at different aspects of faith. So last week we defined faith. What is faith? This week we're going to be talking about directing faith. And in the coming weeks we're going to be talking about how do you deal in, with doubts and navigate through doubts. So before we get to that though, I have a really important announcement. This is business um, for the church. So the past couple weeks we've been talking about the leadership team. We've been uh, having a kind of a little family powwow after the services to tell you who's been nominated. And last week you got the chance to vote on the leadership team. And uh, we gave you a space for concerns if you had concerns and affirmations for those of you that didn't. And um, we just want to say for those of you that had concerns, we totally heard you. We saw them. We read through them. We have prayed through them. We've really seriously considered them. Uh, but the vast majority of everybody voted to affirm the leadership team that was suggested to you. So that's really awesome. That's something we can celebrate is that um, the leadership team is really uh, your voice as the congregation uh, in partnership with the staff helping direct our church. And so more details are going to be coming with that in the future. In the coming days, we'll be bringing the leadership team up, and you'll get to meet them um, kind of publicly on stage, and we'll pray for them as a family and all of those things. But I uh, just wanted to let you know that. So like I said, today we're going to be talking about directing our faith. And uh, I wanted the grip and grin question to be about, are you a, a fast texter or a slow texter? Because I have a very scary slow text story. So... Um, Many of you know I'm in a band. The name of the band is the Timbre of Cedar. I have a great time in this band. I'm technically the worship design coordinator here at Life Church Livonia. What that means is I'm in charge of all the stuff that happens here in the auditorium, including the band. So I organize that and lead them, and I'm often leading that here on a Sunday morning. If this is your first time, uh, you wouldn't know that. But that's what I do here for uh, my job and as part of my calling. Uh, but I'm leading a lot of things here. And why I love the Tambor Cedar so much is I, I get to do all the music stuff I do, but I don't have to lead anybody there. I can just show up and Marty McFly my amp to 10 and play loud electric guitar, and it's awesome. I don't have to know where we're going. I don't have to know what's going on. I don't know when we need to get home. I don't need to know any of that stuff. I just get to show up and play, and it's really awesome, and I really, really love it. So uh, we're coming out with a new song this Friday that we wrote, like, in October. And uh, in October, we went away to do a writing retreat to write some of the songs that we're going to be coming out with soon here. And um, let me tell you something about that. So we were on our way up to this cabin. It was a uh, timeshare cabin, not ours, borrowing it from a friend. I said, yeah, you can get away there for a couple nights to this writing retreat. I said, sweet, near Mount Pleasant, Michigan, had never been. Um, so I text my buddy Sam, who's kind of the leader of our band and the organizer of everything. I said, hey, Sam, hit me up with that, um, the address for that. And he says, cool, text me the address. So I pack my stuff, get my gear in the car, get my clothes, and I'm on my way. So I'm driving to Mount Pleasant. I leave around, you know, it's Sunday afternoon. It was the same day as the... Um, Detroit Free Press Half Marathon, and I had run that that morning, so I was very much looking forward to like three hours in the car sitting <laughs> and was very excited to not be running anymore. Uh, so I left around like 2 p.m., which meant that I was going to get there between 5.30 and 6 p.m. Not a big deal, but it's a new place I'd never been, and it's October. 5.30, 6 p.m. is when the sun sets. So I get to the destination, and I pull up, and as I'm making the final turn, I just... I'm confused because what sh I see on Google Maps, which is better than Waze and Apple Maps, by the way, uh, is that I've arrived at my destination. But what I see in front of me is an abandoned haunted farmhouse, <laughs> complete with a creaking door in the wind. You know, uh, and, I, and I don't see their car. And I'm like, this can't be right. 
And so I text Sam, and I'm like, hey, Sam, can you text me back? I, this is the wrong address. Can I get the new address, please? But like I said, it's like 5.36 p.m., so the sun's starting to go down, and I'm getting a little nervous. And so I decide, you know what, Apple Maps, I dog you so much, I'm going to try you once more. I'm going to give you the benefit of the doubt here. This is your chance to redeem yourself. Plug the same address into Apple Maps. And to my joy, I see that it says the real destination is across the street. And I think, awesome, Apple Maps, you came through for me. And so I started driving across the street, but the issue was, it was like a T. There was no across the street. I was here, and this was a forest. <laughs> and I was like, Apple Maps, this is why I hate you. <laughs> but as I pull up to the stop sign, and I'm like, are you kidding me? What am I going to do? I notice Apple Maps isn't totally wrong. There is a small dirt trail through the trees, kind of hidden in the woods, that has tire tracks in it. And I'm like, wow, this is actually a cabin in the woods. So I drive across the street and kind of brave my way onto this dirt trail. And I drive down the trail probably a little bit farther than I'm actually comfortable with because I'm following these tire tracks, and I'm, trying, I'm going, okay, well, we got to find a thing. And sure enough, I come upon a house. The lights are on, cars are in the grass, people are home. But there's still no van from my band. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, Apple Maps, this isn't right either. And so I go to get out to ask these people for directions, and then I pause as I'm opening the door and think to myself, wait, these people live on a hidden trail in a cabin in the woods. <laughs> are they, is this... Am I going to shoot me if I show up unexpectedly? And I ran a half marathon that morning, so I'm a little delusional, and I'm, my rationale is not totally clear. And I think to myself, I'm going to die out here. If Sam isn't texting me back. These people are going to kill me. And so I gently close my door and try with as little sound as possible to back up and kind of reposition to come back out this dirt trail. And I park again by the haunted house. At this point, I need my headlights on to see because it's actually dark. And I'm really starting to get scared. And I'm thinking, what am I going to do? What if Sam doesn't text me back? What if he didn't see my text? What if his phone is dead? What if this happens? What if that happens? And in my kind of panicking, just to complete this scenario, this scrappy-looking wolf-like dog comes wandering out from behind this abandoned farmhouse and starts pacing the yard watching me. And not like, you know, like cute dogs watching, oh, are you my new friend? But like, oh, are you my new meal kind of thing. You know, so he's like watching me, watching me, and I'm like, okay, I'm going home. I'm done. This is it. I'm not going to die out here. The band is fun. You guys aren't worth it. I'm not going to do this. And so I start actually driving away, and then Sam texts me back, oh, dude, my bad. Sorry. <laughs> this is like a half hour later. Sorry. Here's the actual address. And so, you know, he texted me just in time, but I was so scared, and I was so mad. I was, I was thinking the worst things about Sam in my mind. He's one of my best friends, and I'm just, like, trashing him, like, okay, Sam, yeah, I'll text you the address. Sam, okay, Alex, you know, really funny, abandoned farmhouse, Sam, you know. And I'm <laughs> thinking these awful things about my poor friend. I was really afraid in that moment, and, and my fear caused a lot of what-ifs. You see, what we're going to be talking about today is fear and faith. And all of us are really looking for, really made for stability and security. Lots of things happen in life that make us afraid. That's just a part of life. And fear is destabilizing by nature. Sometimes those things are small. We get over them quickly. Sometimes those things are life-changing and cataclysmic events that mark and scar our lives in deep ways. But whether they're small, like uh, Sam not texting me back quickly, or whether they're really big, fear is destabilizing. And when we fall prey to fear, we start asking, what if? Like, goes, what if Sam doesn't text me back? What if I die out here at the hands of these people in the woods? <laughs> what if this dog makes it into my car and eats me? <laughs> right? But there are more serious ones, too. Like, what if mom doesn't recover from the accident? What if he or she in this relationship doesn't want to work through it anymore? What if I don't have what it takes? Because this is so hard right now. What if the bill is higher than I thought? or that check doesn't come in on time? What if this thing that I believe about God, that this thing, this way I'm, I'm living into my belief in church, what if that's not true? What if God doesn't really care about me? What if I'm not worth it? What if, what if, what if, what if? Our what ifs can be about doubts, 
They can be about God. They can be about ourselves. They can be about others. They can be about pain, about trials, relationships, conflict. In order to restabilize in the midst of these what ifs, we have to fill in a gap. And the way we fill in that gap is what faith is. You see, faith is simply how we manage the gap between what is and what if. Faith is simply the way we manage the gap between what is and what if. We all have faith. It's not a choice. It's just a part of life. You see, the future is not real. The future is in your imagination. It doesn't exist yet. It's not here. The present is here. The present is real. The present is now. The future is conjecture. It's an act of imagination, right? And because of that, we can't control it. You can't control something that's not real. It's not real. And so we use faith to fill in that gap between what if and what is. We all have faith. And the reason we do that is because we all long for that assurance that even though life is scary right now, even though it's hard, even though I can't see well right now, that my future is, is good. That no matter what happens, I'm going to be okay and all will be well. We long for that security. We long for that assurance. And so we use faith to create it. To, to create it. So our, our, our faith is how we answer the what ifs of life. But if you've been around the block a little bit, you know that not all of your answers have been equal. Some of your answers to the what ifs of life have helped you actually weather the storms of life with integrity, with strength, with purpose, with hope, and you come out stronger on the other side, and, and the storm actually becomes a gift to your life, not a curse. But like I said, if you've been around the block, you know that doesn't happen every time. That's not a guarantee. Some of the ways, some of the things we put our faith in, some of the ways we answer our what-ifs actually wound and scar us in ways that change our lives forever. Just because you have faith in something doesn't mean that faith is directed in the right way. And, and so the question that I want to be uh, asking today is, how do we walk on water instead of drowning in the storms of life? How do we walk on water instead of drowning in the storms of life? This is what our, our series is about. And, and just as a quick aside, you know, you can, anxiety, for example, is a powerful act of faith in the wrong direction that says, if I think about this enough, if I give all of my imagination and energy to this enough to try to come up with a solution, I will feel like my future is good again. I will feel like I will be okay. That sense of peace and security I'm longing for will come. But if you struggle with anxiety, you know the opposite is true. It destroys your life. It totally isolates and encapsulates you by yourself and, and, and hurts you in deep ways. That's a powerful act of faith, but it's a bad direction. That's how we answer the what ifs. So how do we walk on water instead of drowning in the storm? Well, to answer our question, we're going to take a look at the life of a man named Peter. This series is taken from a really specific scripture. The, the title is taken from a specific scripture in the New Testament in the book of Matthew. And um, you know, I don't claim to have all the answers about this stuff. This is really hard. Life is really complex. And, and to stand up here and give you uh, platitudes as a 26-year-old would be a disservice to you. But what I can do is tell you that I have faith that God's word is true, and that when I obey it, the storms of life don't crush me. And what I can do here is just offer you my insights into the passage that we've taken this series from and the passage that we're going to take a look at today. And I can't apply them to your life for you, but I can show you how they've applied to mine, and I can show you... Uh, the, the general concepts that Jesus is trying to communicate here. So that's what we're going to do today. I, I don't want to stand up here um, and, and speak with a kind of authority that's uh, not appropriate and, and not fair to you. Um, so, but what I can do is, is show you what I see in the scriptures. So let's read together. It says, Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into a boat and go on ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. After he dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. Later that night, he was there alone, and the boat was already a considerable distance from land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them, walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and they cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, 
Take courage, it is I. Don't be afraid. Lord, if it's you, Peter said, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid. Beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me! And immediately Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You have little faith, he said. Why did you doubt? When they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. Then those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. So as I studied this passage, uh, I noticed three things that really stood out to me. And again, I don't um, want to claim that I have more authority or information or answers on this Um, than are in the scriptures. But these things really stood out to me in regards to how do you walk on water. The first thing I noticed is that there's multiple storms going on here. You see, just before this passage takes place, this is in the middle of chapter 14 in the book of Matthew. What we find out at the beginning of chapter 14 is that Jesus' cousin, John the Baptist, has been killed. Jesus finds that out for the first time in the beginning of chapter 14. And just so you get a a picture of what kind of impact this had on Jesus, um, John was probably the person that understood Jesus most for who he truly was as God's son more than any other person on the planet. And John and Jesus' mothers hung out, were, were, were our relatives, but close friends before they're even born. And so Jesus and John were raised together. And it's really clear from the scriptures that God's hand was on John's life in a very unique way, almost as unique as Jesus' life. And John is there with Jesus in all these kind of major moments of Jesus' life. In fact, when Jesus begins the ministry he's now doing, the one that inaugurates that with baptism, baptizing Jesus, is John himself. And and Jesus speaks with John with such insider language in that moment. John says, Jesus, you know that you should be the one baptizing me. I shouldn't be doing this. And Jesus says, but this is right. This is what the Father wants. And John says, you're right. You're right, and baptizes Jesus. And and I love reading that because you can tell just by what they don't say, the knowledge between them, the understanding between them. And I don't know if if you've led things before, but, you know, as a parent, as a leader, it's so easy to feel so alone and like nobody gets it. But John got it for Jesus. John got it. He knew what was up. And now he's dead. And Jesus finds this out and is crushed. And so it's, the Bible says that he goes to be alone. He goes to go off by himself and pray. And that's when a crowd of 5,000 people finds out where he is. And they come rushing to him in the middle of him trying to process this grief. And, and what the Bible says is that Jesus has compassion on these people and then teaches them for a whole day and then multiplies five loaves and two fish to feed over 5,000 people. And this taking place here where our scripture begins, where it says immediately, immediately what? Immediately after the 5,000 people were dismissed. So, so Jesus' day has looked like, I found out my best friend, my cousin, is dead. And now I just did this huge day of ministry, feeding all these people. This was really unexpected. I'm happy to do it, but this took a lot of energy, and I just need to be alone. And so he sends his disciples on ahead of him, and he goes up on the mountain to pray. And when he looks down, he sees the disciples caught in this storm. And it's crazy to me. In one of the other accounts, it says that they were rowing hard against the wind for three or four miles until four in the morning. Until four in the morning. Jesus wasn't the only one trying to wrestle through this stuff. He wasn't the only one that just did a whole day of really intense ministry. The disciples did too, all 12 of them. And they are, have been up all night battling for their lives in this storm. But so has Jesus. And so when Jesus comes to them walking on the water, he's not coming as though he's an outsider to the storms they're experiencing. Jesus is wrestling with the storm of grief, of losing his closest friend, of losing one of the only people that really gets it, that gets him. And he, not just physically, literally, but metaphorically, is walking on the water of that storm towards his friends, towards his disciples. And so when he meets them and he calls out to Peter, come, walk on the water with me, he's not inviting Peter into some kind of escapism. 
out of the storm, he's inviting Peter into a different way of encountering the storm, a new way of encountering the storm. And I think for me, when, when life is so hard that my what-ifs have taken over my mind, it is so easy to think that God just doesn't get it. You just don't understand, Lord, because you say to the disciples, don't be afraid, but if you understood what was inside of me, you wouldn't say that because you'd know that my fear was justified. You'd get it. And because you're telling me not to be afraid, you must not get it. But what we see here in the Bible is not that at all. We see Jesus is also walking through a different kind of storm. But he's not battling against the waves in the same way that the disciples were. Jesus had a storm too. And when he invites us to walk on water, he's not inviting us into an escapism out of the storm. He's inviting us to experience it differently. To experience it differently. So that's the first thing I noticed. The second thing I noticed is that you know, Peter sinks. Right? We talk about walking on water as though it's like this grand victory, but Peter totally blows it. <laughs> you know, this wasn't like a very good moment for him. He's humiliated in front of all of his friends. You know, he tries really hard to follow Jesus and totally bombs. And, and, and what blows my mind about this is that I feel like Peter should have gotten it. Peter should have been able to walk on water, and let me tell you why. So this is chapter 14 of the book of Matthew. Peter gets called in chapter 4. Immediately after Peter gets called, Jesus starts healing people. Healing people in crazy ways. Blindness, deafness, leprosy. The things they've had since their birth that are gone. Muteness. And Peter is witnessing all of this. Not only after that, but then Jesus gives this incredible treatise, this Sermon on the Mount, that was like a I have a dream moment in the lives of the people of Israel. It was a speech to define all speeches. It was this incredible manifesto of a new way to follow God. And Peter, who had been an outsider his whole life in the religious community, was now an insider in the front row, listening to the man who had asked him to be his disciple, give this incredible, revolutionary new way of following God. Right after that, <laughs> Jesus heals a guy with leprosy. And then he heals some of the worst diseases imaginable to the Jews, leprosy being one of them. If you had leprosy, you were an outcast. You weren't allowed to touch people. You weren't allowed to talk to people in the Jewish community. You had to live outside of town, and you had to shout unclean anytime you saw somebody. You had to declare yourself as an untouchable. And Jesus touched these people and healed them. This was a huge taboo for Peter's um, whole worldview. Not only that, but Jesus doesn't just heal Jewish people. Jesus heals Gentile people. To, you know, Peter, who had felt like a religious outcast his whole life, the Gentiles were even more so religious outcasts. And we don't see Jesus just exercising his power over the Jews. We see him exercising it over the Gentiles. And Peter witnesses this. Not only that, but right after this in, in the book of Matthew, Peter's mother-in-law falls desperately ill, a kind of illness you would die from in the first century. And Jesus heals her. And Peter's own family experiences the power of God's healing love, the power of Jesus' healing presence. And then after that, they have a storm moment where this has already happened. They are out trying to cross the sea. They're pro-fishermen. They know how to work a boat, and they are struggling in this storm, and they think they're going to die. Jesus is asleep in the boat, and they wake him up and go, Jesus, save us! And Jesus rebukes the wind and the waves. They calm right down, and he looks at all the disciples and go, why would you have such little faith? It's the same Greek word when he says this to Peter. Why would you have such little faith? What's going on here? Why would you have such little faith? So Peter's already experienced not only countless miracles, but almost the same scenario before. Almost this exact scenario. And he still blows it. He still totally blows it. And I think for us, many of us have this, this idea about faith that there is this, you must be this tall to ride kind of sign with the kingdom of heaven. You know, yeah, you got a little faith, but not enough to get on the big boy rides. Not enough to do the big miracles. Let me tell you something. You know, and what's so incredible to me is Peter's little faith doesn't go away after this event. 
In fact, Peter has a very tumultuous relationship with faith his whole life. And what's so cool to me is we see Peter here kind of in the middle years of his life. But he writes the book of 1 Peter after Jesus' resurrection, after he's been pastoring as the rock of the entire church of the world. The papacy, the pope, comes from Peter. The pope uh, comes from this idea that that is the lineage of Peter as the rock of the church. And, and so Peter is essentially the pope of the first century. And, and in the book of 1 Peter, he ends it with, Do, you can cast your anxieties on God because God cares for you which is such this immense statement of faith and trust in God. And so we see Peter end there, but he's not there yet. And what strikes me about that is even though Peter has just a little faith, he walked on water. Even though he has just a little faith, he became the rock of the church. Even though he has just a little faith, he led the church through the greatest trial of persecution and suffering in its history. Even though he had just a little faith. Even though he had just a little faith. Just a little faith was enough for Jesus. Just a little faith was enough for Jesus. There was not a you must be this tall to ride sign. To Jesus, Peter's little faith was enough faith to do great things with. Peter's little faith was enough faith to do great things with. This was a lifelong journey for Peter, and I'll come back to some of the other blunders that he made later, because after Jesus' resurrection, he blows it a couple more times real big, real big. But just a little faith was enough. The third observation I had is that Peter started sinking when he saw the wind. You can't see the wind. The wind is literally invisible. It's like a whole metaphor for things that you can't see. You know what I mean? Like, this doesn't make any sense to me. And what's amazing about this is I just saw myself in that. Because here Peter is, standing on waves, looking at Jesus, who is actually in front of him, also standing on waves. And Peter gets distracted by something he can't even see. And that gap between what is and what if, that power over what holds my future here, the imagination that gives him faith in Jesus has now been captured by something that he can't even see. And I just thought, holy cow, is that me? All of my worries are the wind. They're not really, I can't see them. I just feel them. And I can create these radical, elaborate futures based on information I have totally made up just a couple seconds prior. And that just rocked my world. Because what happens here, the reason Peter starts to sink is not that he didn't have enough faith, it's that he had misdirected faith. A little faith was enough to Jesus. But that little faith, while it was pointing at Jesus allowed Peter to experience that storm in a very different way. And as soon as Peter's faith, as soon as his imagination gets captured by something other than Jesus, it runs away. And what blew my mind, too, is thinking about that, while, uh, that, that what had captured Peter's faith had determined his future. Peter became just like the thing that had captured his faith. While it was Jesus, he was acting like Jesus. Jesus was standing on the water. And while Peter's faith and imagination were captured by Jesus, Peter was standing on the water. When Peter's faith and imagination are captured by the waves, because that's the only way you can see the wind with water, when it was captured by the waves, he became just like the waves and became part of the tumultuous sea. And he cries out to Jesus to save him, and Jesus does. And what's so funny here is um, two things. That Jesus doesn't scold him. I think many of us feel that, like, uh, that not having enough faith means God is disappointed in who we are or something. That like our, our trials, our storms are a disappointment to God. And he's looking going, you know, this wouldn't have happened if you just had a little more faith in me. And, and, and what I want to communicate today is it's, that's not the case. It's not the amount of faith that's the problem. Jesus said with a mustard seed, a little bit of faith, you can move mountains into the sea. The little bit of faith wasn't the problem. The problem was that it was misdirected. It's something else, something that wasn't Jesus. 
And Peter's future became directed by the thing that had captured his faith. Now, <clears throat> those are my observations for, for uh, this scripture on how we walk on water. But as I was just praying and asking God, you know, Lord, what do you want them to know? What do you want me to know to help us to not be afraid? Because those are great uh, insights, but that doesn't eradicate my fear in the midst of the waves. And God just said to me, I want them to know that I am with them in the waves. That I am with them in the waves. And that no matter what is going on in your life, whether your faith is directed at the wind, because Jesus didn't magically disappear. He's not an imaginary character that just disappeared once Peter's faith was captured by something else. Jesus was right there. He was right there the whole time when Peter was doing well and when he was doing really poorly. When Peter was succeeding and when he was failing. When he was standing and when he was sinking. Jesus was right there in the waves. And what Jesus says that I caught this time around reading this was that it's not that we need to um, <clears throat> not be afraid because it makes sense, which is what I jumped to, right? Like, okay, Lord, show me the future, and it will make sense, and now I'm not afraid. Because I want that security. I want my what if to be answered by, it's okay, but your future, it's good. It'll be all right. It's okay. And Jesus doesn't give us that, which is infuriating, <laughs> but true. What Jesus said is, hey, it is I. It's me. I am here. Don't be afraid. And what struck me about that, why that's so important, is that my anxieties come from the idea that I can't control the future because I can't control the wind and the waves. They don't obey me. And what Jesus is saying, because they've experienced the same situation before, what he's saying is, guys, I am here. The wind and waves might not obey you, but they do obey me. And I am with you in the waves. So don't be afraid. So don't be afraid. So how do we practically direct our faith in the midst of storms? How do we practically apply this to our lives in a tangible way, in a tangible world? Um, a couple things really stood out to me here. Uh, that, that Jesus kind of says to Peter, and, and just uh, some things from the text that really uh, captured my imagination, I guess. The first thing was that if you want to stand in the waves, you have to be ready for the up and down. That faith is an up and down journey. I gave you some of Peter's blunders, but right after this happens, they're disciples. Disciples of what? What's the point of a disciple? You want them to learn something, right? So what is Jesus trying to get these knuckleheads to learn? He's trying to get them to learn that I'm not going to be here right, right now like this for long, and you have to carry this on without me. And if you're going to carry this on without me, you need to have faith that I am who I say I am, that I am the Messiah and the Son of God. And that has to be enough faith to carry this on without me. Shortly after this happens, Peter declares that Jesus is the Messiah. And that's a turning point in the journey of Jesus, where he stops trying to perform miracles and convince them he is who he says he is, and it directs him back towards Jerusalem. And Peter, because he's the one that said this, gets very cocky and starts trying to tell Jesus what to do. <laughs> and Jesus says, get behind me, Satan, <laughs> and fires it right back. And what's so crazy about this to me is, Peter has all this gusto now, all this heart, all this passion, and he still totally blows it. When Jesus is crucified, the night he's crucified, Peter denies Jesus three times and in such a deep way that he is no longer a part of the disciples. His faith got shattered in that moment. Because when Jesus rises from the dead, he tells the, the women, Mary and Mary, that found him, hey, go tell the disciples and Peter, specifying and Peter, go tell the disciples and Peter, I'm alive. And then Peter and Jesus have this beautiful moment a little bit later where they're at this lake and, and they're eating and, and Jesus says to Peter, hey, Peter, do you love me? Peter's like, yeah, I love you, Lord. And he said, then feed my sheep. Hey, Peter, do you love me? Yeah, I love you, Lord. Then feed my flock. Peter, do you love me? And Peter's offended at this point, like, yes, God, I love you. Yes, okay, I, I love you. Then feed my sheep. And I love that because Peter totally blew it. His faith totally cracked under pressure. And three times Peter denied God, and three times Jesus gives him a chance to reaffirm his love and totally restores that relationship. Not only that, 
But you'd think now Peter's learned, right? Peter's got it now. It's okay. I'm good at this again. And he's not. <laughs> God gives Peter this vision that Gentiles are the same as Jews. All of people are equal. All of people are clean. And a couple chapters later, Peter is being racist and not eating with Gentiles and only eating with Jews and has to get called out by Paul. Paul didn't see that vision. Peter saw that vision. And yet Peter is struggling again in his faith. So what I find amazing about that is we are so much less okay with the up and down of our faith journey than God is. God is not scared of that in the same way that we are. It just doesn't freak him out. And I love that because he recognizes that if you're going to stand on the waves, there's going to be a lot of up and down. And he's okay with that. Are you? Are you okay with that? Second thing, uh, if you're going to walk in any kind of faith, you got to get out of the boat. And, and what I mean by that is most of us, when it comes to walking in faith, want a warranty and a guarantee. We want, I want to be sure this works, and just in case it doesn't, I want to be able to bring it back with a full refund. You know what I mean? Like, we want this, this like, foolproof idea that, okay, if I step out, I'm not going to fall. Okay, you know what I mean? Like, we, we want that, and we don't get it. That's not how it works. That's, it's, it's faith. You can't control the future. Accept it. You're not a superhero. That's not your superpower. It's okay. We're all human. That's all right. But if you want to walk through the storms of life in a different way, you got to be able to take a step. And whatever that is right now, again, like I said at the beginning, I don't know your life. I can't speak for you. But I do know that if you're going to walk through these storms of life differently in a way where you're walking on the water and not drowning in it, you got to take a step of faith. One step. A little faith is enough. Even with a little faith, Peter was the rock of the church. And even with a little faith, God can change your life. Number three is don't be afraid. And what I mean by don't be afraid is this. Fear is incredibly self-centering. Just like anger and shame are. Incredibly self-centering. I find it fascinating that Jesus' solution to Peter Restoring his faith in God is, hey, feed my sheep. Hey, feed my sheep. Hey, feed my sheep. Almost as if to say, hey, Peter, I know you're struggling with this right now, bud. I love you. I, I, I know you love me. I'm asking you so you can tell me yes, right? But hey, you freaking out right here is not the reason I came. There's a lot of other things I care about, a lot of other people I care about. Because we've talked a lot about Peter and Jesus in this storm. But guess what? There was 11 other guys in the boat still rowing while all of this was happening. Peter wasn't thinking about them, and we weren't thinking about them. Because that's what fear does. That's what fear does. It captures your imagination and just tunnel visions you. And so Jesus' response to Peter is, hey, if you want to walk in faith with me, care about other people in the way I care about other people. You don't have to have all the answers. You don't have to be able to walk on water by yourself. That's not a prerequisite. I didn't say that. I just need you to take care of other people the way I have taken care of other people. These things will work themselves out, Peter. Be patient. And I love that, and I think that's such a powerful admonition for us. Because guess what, guys? Jesus isn't afraid of your future. Jesus isn't afraid of your future. Whatever the what-ifs in your life are, be they financial, personal, be they new, be they old, Jesus isn't afraid of those things. And he, he's just kind of, I just see him kind of hugging Peter like a dad around the shoulder here and going, hey, bud, I know you're really scared right now. I know this is really hard, but there are other people here that I care about, and I need you to care about them too. And if you want to get out of this cycle of fear and live in faith, care about the things I care about. That's how you walk with me. Because you can't follow me unless you follow me. If I'm loving people and you're not, you're not walking with me on the water. And so as we close today, I don't know where you're at. I don't know where you're at. I don't know what's going on in your life. I don't know what the what-ifs are. I don't know where you feel like you need to be this tall to ride the journey of faith. But God does. And a couple chapters after this passage we just read, Jesus gives his life on the cross. And he gives his life on the cross 
so that all of our sins, all of our fears, all of our failures, all of our shame would be put to death with him in the grave. And when he rises from the dead, I find it so interesting he reconciles with Peter when he rises from the dead and not before. He could have done it before. He's God, right? Why after? Because he was offering Peter this new life. It was impossible for Peter to have faith in Jesus at the moment of the wind and the wave story because Jesus hadn't died and risen from the dead yet. Peter has faith, you will do this, you will save us, but he hadn't saved them yet. And when Jesus rose from the dead, he was offering Peter a real life, a now life, a new life, and he offers us that life today. And so if you're here this morning and your imagination is just going crazy with your what-ifs, God is here offering you a new life in Christ. A life where your merits, where your sins, where your faith aren't the final word. His love for you is. The last thing that just shook me deep is I read this story. Is that Peter's faith in Jesus didn't affect Jesus' faith in Peter. Jesus continued to trust Peter over and over again. Betrayal after betrayal, time after time. And continued to believe, I know you can do this, Peter. I know you can be who I've called you to be. And this morning, your faith in God does not affect his faith in you. He has made you for a purpose. And he is relentless in that. And he is willing to walk slow and see that through. So if you're being moved this morning by the Holy Spirit and he's moving inside of you and you know that you need that new life, you know that you need Jesus to help you start again, to to have a life of faith, to have a life where you don't have to have enough because he is enough for you, I just want to invite you to pray with me right now. Oh, Lord Jesus. Father, I admit that I have been afraid and that I've had so many doubts and the what-ifs in my life have driven my life. And God, I've put barriers for myself in following you because I don't feel like I have enough faith. And Lord, I just accept that I don't have to. That all I need to do is direct my faith at you and you will take care of the rest. And so God, I give you my faith right now. I give you my life right now. I ask that you would be Lord of my life. I ask that you would direct my faith. And I ask, Lord, that you would help me to walk through these storms of life in a new way. In the name of Jesus, amen.